Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Creator Economics. Wanted to bring on someone from the financial space, uh, and that person is Graham Stephan. Blake and I have been watching Graham Stephan's videos for a while and thought it would be incredibly interesting for him to come on, talk a little bit about personal finance, a little bit about investing, and then just how he got started as a YouTuber and some advice for aspiring creators. Enjoy. How did you get started? Like, what was the first moment, like when you posted a YouTube video? Like, where did this all start? Oh gosh, I wanted to make YouTube videos since back in like 2010. And I think, I think it was like 2014, I started making YouTube videos, but I never posted them. I wanted to do videos about the real estate market and working as a real estate agent. So, and it's so corny, but like I, I set up a GoPro in my Prius and as I was like driving to showings, I would record myself on a GoPro, just rambling for like 15 minutes. And I would then go and delete it try it again, delete it. I never posted it. And I kept doing that. Maybe every few months be like, okay, now I'm going to post a YouTube video. Now I just got too scared. I honestly, I, I just thought no one would want to watch me. Uh, it's not going to be interesting. People, people are going to see this who know me and they'll be like, oh, that's kind of lame. That sucks. And I just didn't post. And I think it was, yeah. So it was late 2016, like December, 2016. I had this moment where I thought to myself, if I don't do this now, I'm never going to do it. And I at least want to take that shot and see how it turns out. So I just, I filmed an impromptu video at an open house. It was like a 30 minute video that I edited down to like 21 minutes. There, there it was like the worst editing. And by the way, I had no idea what I was doing. So I would go on YouTube and type in like iMovie tutorials. I would learn how to edit. I had no idea really like how to do a thumbnail. So I just kind of put some stuff together. It's really bad. And uh, I, I learned how to use like descriptions and tags and I watched enough YouTube to kind of have an idea like these, this title should be okay. So I posted the video and I had so much fun doing that. And what I would do is I'd go and comment on other channels being like, hey, I like this video. And I just added my own thoughts on their channel as a comment. And then I put at the end, by the way, I just posted a video about how I got started in real estate. Let me know what you guys think. And it was so cool to see people commenting, hey, I came from this guy's channel. I, a lot of it back in the begin, beginning, I think it was Grant Cardone, Alex Becker, Ty Lopez. I was commenting on all of their videos and uh, it was so cool. I had so much fun seeing people comment and like be supportive. So I kept posting videos. And in the beginning, I'd, like, I, was, uh, I wasn't expecting to make any money from it. So I'd, like, I purposely turned off monetization because at the time it's like a lot of these money gurus we're just trying to blast you with ads. They were trying to sell you something. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to be the guy who's running ads or anything like that. And then I realized like, wait a second, if YouTube's a business, it makes sense for them to promote the content that is going to make them money. So why don't I turn on ads? And then at the very least, YouTube is able to monetize this content and they're going to make some money from it. And if it helps me reach a greater audience, then I'm all for it. So I turned on ads. I had no idea if that was just coincidence or if it was just random timing but as soon as i turned on ads my channel just like tripled almost overnight and again that could be just weird timing but uh all of a sudden then i was starting to make like 20 cents a day 30 cents a day i just kept growing and growing and growing and one day just i think three or four months into it the algorithm just randomly decided to promote some of my content as an up next to ty lopez and it was one day i made 183 dollars, and i was more excited about being able to make $183 online posting videos for fun than I was like closing a commission as a real estate agent. Like that to me was so like mind blowing that I could make money online. And that was the point when I realized like, hey, wait a second, maybe I'm onto something. So I set a schedule to myself every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 3.30 PM, I was gonna post a video no matter what. And then about a year and a half ago, I decided to give it full time. I, I just, I loved it so much. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense for me to do anything other than what I'm just obsessed about. And so I went full time in YouTube. I started multiple channels. Everything kept growing. And now, and now I'm really at a point where uh, I, I, I have no idea where it's going to lead from here. But I just I really enjoy the process. And it's just been so exciting. Man, what a story. That's that's amazing. And, and I mean, I, I think maybe just for some context to people who might not know you, obviously you talked about your real estate and past, like what was that like? What, like, how did you even end up in real estate and, and how did you transition into, uh, I guess just like broader financial or just financial advice in general from real estate? 
Uh, real estate for me came about because I just had terrible grades in high school. And for me, real estate, I'd get my real estate license because I just needed to graduate high school. Like if I could basically just do that, I was good. But when I didn't get into college, I figured, okay, now I could get my real estate license. This is something I could just do for a year and then I'll reapply to colleges and got my real estate license, happened to really love it. And after I think it was, it took me about nine months to sell my first house. And when I sold my first house, I was like, all right, this is it. I'm never going back to school ever again. This is what I want to do. But just in, in the back of my mind, I was always just, I've always just been into personal finance. I'd, I'd save every single commission that I would make as an agent. I saved it up for, it took me three and a half, four years of saving that uh, I then used to buy my first rental property. And during that entire time, I was on Reddit and uh, there was a community called financial independence. Well, at first, it was personal finance, uh, and I was in that uh, subreddit all day. It's just like if I had any downtime, I was in the Reddit personal finance community. We'd just be talking personal finance. Like I enjoyed that kind of stuff. Then that, then that subreddit got a little bit too crowded, so we all kind of moved over to financial dependence. And I would just sit there for free all day, just you know, typing away on, on the subreddit, giving – well, not giving financial advice, but like giving my own two cents, like reading up on what other people – what other situations they have. So uh, I would say that uh, for me, in terms of the financial aspect, like I never went into YouTube thinking I would be talking about finances. I went in originally talking about like how to be a real estate agent, how, how to invest in real estate. I wanted to be the real estate guy. But after a certain point, I begin to realize that like the, the real estate niche is only so big. Like you could only stay in real estate so long before you, you should start expanding to other things. And plus, I mean, there's not that much to talk about with real estate. I mean, the core principles are the exact same today as they will be in five years from now. So I thought to myself, well, there's a whole bunch of other concepts I want to talk about. So let's talk about personal finance. Let's talk about passive income. And a lot of it too was strategic. I would see what videos were getting recommended on YouTube. So I'd look at my homepage and I'd see, okay, well, I'm getting five passive income videos recommended to me in like 15 minutes. It's probably a sign that people want to hear about passive income. So I'll make a passive income video. I guess I've just really tried adapting to what people want to click on and what they want to see. And if, if there's something that I see getting recommended to me, I'm like, that's a cue that I should probably talk about this too. Hmm. What's your like breakdown in time between the two now? Like what do you spend on YouTube versus like, what do you spend in real estate? Oh gosh. Uh, probably 95% YouTube, 5% real estate. The real estate at this point is just for myself. If, if I have an interest in buying something, I'll spend some time on that. Um, managing the rental properties really isn't too much work. It's maybe like an hour or two a month. So maybe more, maybe it's like 98% YouTube. Mm -hmm. And then is, has your team evolved at all? And, and I think the, the most successful YouTubers that I know have all done, they've done everything, right? They've edited, they've made their own thumbnails, they've done their own creative. You had to do everything starting out in your YouTube career. Is that still consistent? Are you still doing everything or like what's your team look like internally? Yeah, yeah, yes and no. So uh, I did everything up until the point of about a year ago. Uh, so I did really like two channels on my own, all titles, all thumbnails, everything. And uh, at, at, the, at the height of doing that, I was posting a video a day, uh, seven videos a week. And it got to a point about a year and a few months ago where it just got overwhelming. I was basically at the point where I was so stressed out. If, if I wasn't working, I was panicking because I'm like, there's so much to do and I don't have enough time. So that was the point when I started to notice the quality of my second channel, The Graham Stephan Show, was starting to decline because it got to a point for me where I was just trying to churn these videos out. So it just so happened that a guy, uh, his name is Jack, he was helping me out a little bit on the second channel, kind of fielding phone calls and, and helping me out with some back-end emails on the side. It was some part-time work. Uh, he took a break from college, and he thought he had like three months off, basically. And he's like, I want to come work full-time for three months. I'm like, okay, you know what? That's a, that's a good trial. We could try this for three months, and uh, I'll teach you how to edit my reaction videos on the second channel. And he learned how to edit those videos better than I could. So I basically just, I said, this is what I want. Here's what I do. And he, since he had nothing else, he was able to spend like eight, nine, 10 hours on, a, on editing a reaction video that I was trying to churn out in like an hour and a half because I didn't have the time. Once he started doing that, the quality of that second channel 
really started growing. So we started getting more views. Uh, the entire channel was growing subscribers. We had some of our best months ever. And, uh, that, and that gave me more time to focus back on the main channel. I was able to make better quality content on the main channel. But basically, what my team is now, I do everything on the main channel. So everything you see, nothing has stayed, nothing has changed on that. So I still do everything start to finish, the same three videos a week. Um, Jack and I will, will collaborate on thumbnails, but I like that he's able to look at these thumbnails from a different perspective. Because when I'm in it all day and I create a thumbnail, sometimes he'll see it and be like, I don't like that. Or sometimes we'll see somebody and had this abstract idea of like, let me push $10,000 in your face and we'll take a picture of that. And I'm like, yeah, okay, let's do that. And we'll throw explosions in the back, like something crazy. So, uh, so we have fun with that. Then we have a third guy, his name is Alex. He edits the videos on our podcast. He works with some of the sponsorships of the podcast and uh, he also films and edits the videos for the Stiff family. So that's the vlog channel. So we have very designated things that each of us do. But for me, the main channel is 100% me. I've always kept it me. I felt like that's the, that's the backbone of the entire brand. I want to keep it like that. But yeah, at this point, just the three of us, that's, that's probably enough for now. We keep it lean. Wow, that, that's crazy. Do you have a manager or no? Or do you manage everything on, on your side as well? Yeah, everything, everything I, I do myself. Um, so some of it's like, yeah, there's a lot that falls through the cracks. I will admit, um, I want most emails, unfortunately, go on red. There's, there's stuff that, there's stuff, honestly, that's probably being missed. I'll, I'll admit to that. Um, but otherwise, I, uh, I do everything myself. So in terms of strategy, you know, I, I was looking at your channel and you haven't done any YouTube shorts yet. Is there, is there a reason you haven't experimented on the main channel with YouTube shorts? Or is it something that you're just like doesn't fit on the main channel, not going to do it. Maybe I'll start a different channel. Have you thought at all about that? It's tough because I don't watch YouTube shorts and it's, it's difficult for me because I only do things that like I myself would want to watch. And I hate to say, it, but every single time I see shorts, it bugs me because it just, it ruins my subscription feed. And there have been creators, honestly, I, I don't mind them. It's like, you know, I'll watch every, watch a video every now and then from them. It's like every fifth video, I'm like, ah, Alex, you know, I'll watch that. But I'm seeing those creators posting shorts like every day. And it's, I don't like scrolling, but ah, there's another one, I'm not interested. So like I've started unsubscribing from certain channels that I'm just you know, not, not that into because they're posting these shorts that keep showing up in the subscription feed. So because I'm not into it, I just, I have a hard time coming into it with that passion that like, if it's something I, I would watch, I'll do it, but I'm just not there yet. I'm curious, like you mentioned it a little bit uh, before where you're talking about how some of the other financial YouTubers that you've seen or just creators in general are sometimes like slimy or just trying to sell you something. Mm -hmm. You've done a really good job of like being authentic and yourself. And I think people really do trust you. How do you balance that like with just monetizing in general or thinking about monetizing your channel, especially when I imagine there's a thousand probably crypto companies that are like, Hey, show oh, my yeah. random coin or whatever. And, or some random company that's probably offering you a bunch of money, but you're like, I don't know if I can get behind that. How do you just balance that? And especially from your side or just saying, Hey, I'm going to go and sell a bunch of courses, you know, that yeah. you know, say get rich quick. Um, I mean, at this point, honestly, any, I don't want to say any additional income, but it's like, uh, even, even a million bucks or even on, I get honest, like even, even like $5 million either way is not, is not going to change my life at all. Um, obviously I, I think I would, I would rather have 5 million than, than not have it. But if that's coming at any detriment to me whatsoever, I'd rather just not take it. Like as far as monetization, throwing ads in a YouTube video, that's always pretty harmless. I, I mean, I, I spent probably 12 to 15 hours each video the ads themselves are, you know, you skip them if you're not into it. That's fine. Uh, sponsorships, I formed some really great relationships with sponsors that I like. I really like their product a lot. So I have no qualms whatsoever throwing an ad in a video. But I really just try to think, like, is this going to help me and what I'm, what I'm about long term? If the answer to that is no, I won't do it. But there's really, there's no amount of money that, that you could pay me at this point that, would, that I would risk tarnishing my brand over. And, I'm sure, and maybe there might be something in the future that I'm just truly unaware about. And I end up getting caught up in something like that. But, 
but yeah, I've got approached quite a bit. It's, it's almost on a daily basis for, for especially the crypto coins. Oh gosh. Um, yeah, no, I've been offered hundreds of thousands of dollars just to make a, a video talking about one of these coins. I won't do it. I mean, it's like at what cost? Sure. You make 500 grand, but then what is that going to look like a year from now? Does that mean now that like no one takes me seriously? It's so to me, it's a, it's a very easy no brainer. If anything is going to risk my reputation or my brand that I've spent my entire life trying to build up to, it's just, it's not worth it. And there's, there's no amount of money that would change my mind. Who, uh, who are the two brands that you said you had two long-term partners? Who are those? And then how, how did you meet those brands? Did they come to you? Did you reach out to them? And then uh, the, the next question I would say is like, what do you have any advice for like creators out there that are like trying to work with brands or trying to find brand deals? I probably get that question the most in my DMS. Hey, yeah. how do I find brand deals? How do I get brand deals? Um, just curious. Yeah. Um, wh one of the ones that uh, one of the OG, uh, sponsors of my channel was simply safe. And this is, I've been working with them now for probably like two and a half years. They found me when I was a you know, small channel. They sent me a, and I, and I remember their first email. They wanted to, uh, they wanted to sponsor a video. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to have you sponsor a video until I try out the product myself. They sent me a full on simply safe system. I set it up in the house and I was like, all right, I really like this a lot. And I, and I, I use it. So, uh, that was an easy one and they've been fantastic. And we do a monthly sponsorship on the uh, second channel. We've done several on the main channel. Uh, the, the two other ones, uh, policy genius has been really nice to me. They've been really kind. Uh, they're, and, 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 and they're good too, because they'll save you money. So like a lot of these things are, are, uh, integrations where like, if you benefit from this, it's not like, it's not like you're paying out money for something. You don't get as much back in return. Like all of these are good things. If, if I would use it myself. I'm happy to talk about it. So all of these things are something I'd use myself. Oh, one last one even. Omaze. I like Omaze. Everyone likes Omaze. Um, I remember before even uh, before they even reached out to me, I bought tickets. I tried to win a Ford GT before like I really even knew like what Omaze was about. But I thought like, all right, before I buy a Ford GT, let me try buying tickets to get this red one. And I mean, I didn't win, but uh, like I enjoy it. I think it's cool. Uh, the, the fact that I could also help support a good cause in the process, I'm all for it. Uh, I'm curious on, on that note, like how do you balance, are you, are you signing long-term deals with, I don't know, let's say a brokerage like a public or a Weeble, or are you, uh, you know, doing one-offs, like just purely off of like conflicts yeah. of interest or saying like exclusivity, because I imagine in the financial space, there's tons of like, hey, we don't want you to accidentally promote a competitor yeah. type of thing. Um, some of these, some of these integrations I did sign on for, you know, a specific period of time. Some of that to me was almost like mentally, it made me feel better knowing that, okay, like at the very least, no matter what happens, I got this kind of locked in. I try to balance it though. So I'm never just locked in to all of these things for, you know, however long. How do you balance? Cause I know you're also doing a little bit of angel investing as well. And I've seen you, you know, in some of the companies that I've invested in or either Blake has invested in, are people now coming to you, like also wanting you to do brand deals and then also asking you to angel invest? Like, how are you finding deals to angel invest in? Yeah. Um, so if I see something that I could, that I could use my own platform, uh, to talk about and just, if, if it's something I would use myself and I'm able to invest in them and I'm able to share my, I'm all for it. Uh, usually I want to say with pretty much everything I've done so far, I have not been able to angel invest in them. It's tough because I probably get a, a, a few requests every few days just to throw money at something. At first I was really like, wow, this is this incredible opportunity. I would be stupid not to do it. But now when you sing just how many of them out there, it makes me really selective. Unfortunately, I think a lot of the good deals out there that the companies that I would want to invest in. You're giving me these valuations. I'm like, that's stupid. And, may, and maybe I'm the stupid one. But I just think we're getting these valuations right now that are based on last year, especially in fintech. Everyone in fintech can right now say, look at how much we've grown year over year. Because last year we had a shutdown and people went berserk for finance. But I think, I think most of these companies are going to see a 50% decline. I think that's normal. I just think what they're basing it off of was, uh, was really just an anomaly year. For, for fintech. So I think it'll probably take a year for some of these valuations to reach, I think, where they should be. 
yeah i mean i i, I do seed investing so i mean it, it's it the valuations are insane uh and it, it's it's a whole other conversation of just what's out there right now but I, I i'm curious just even on the angel investing side because there is some element of i don't know let's say you do yada there is another piece of like you might now have some conflict of interest if another i don't know savings or bank or whatever you want to call it, like whatever category that is like are you thinking about that as well when you're doing the angel investments of like maybe this will uh i don't know conflict no. you out of doing Blake this. and I have also like, filmed multiple yeah. episodes on equity versus cash so this has been <laughs> yeah. like a hot topic for all like the whole creator economy yeah. the balance so so let's let's talk about your first one um no i i don't i don't worry about a conflict of interest because it's like i'm not just that would be silly of me to just pigeonhole myself in one company where I'm not the one running the company. I'm just providing some capital to it. I'm not the one who gets to make the decisions. It would be stupid to be like, well, I'm worried about talking about this other thing, which is really good because I've invested in this thing that, uh, and, and here's the thing too. So many things change. If me talking about another company is going to ruin them, then that's not a company that I should have been investing in. And, and, and I understand too, I'm sure some of my investments are not going to pan out, but, uh, I would rather just talk about things that I want to talk about than worry about a conflict of interest. Yeah. Yeah. Jimmy and I talk about a lot, like the, just the honey PayPal acquisition, him and I trying to get an equity deal pretty early on, they would only give us cash. And then obviously everyone knows like they sold to PayPal for $4 billion. And now it's like, I think all these creators are finally realizing they have leverage to actually get cash plus equity in a lot of these deals. And so it'll be interesting to see like how many of those actually come to fruition. And when some of these companies do exit or go public, are there now creators on the cap table? There undoubtedly will be. Um, it'll just be interesting over the next few years, how many of those companies exit with creators on the balance or on the cap table that actually just leverage themselves into that cap table by just like promoting the business. But there is a lot of gray area, um, which Blake and I have talked about on multiple episodes. It's like, if you invest in a, a company, say in the banking space, a lot of those like founders now think that like, Hey, this person's never going to promote another banking product. And I think it's just like upfront conversation of like, I'm investing in your company because I like it. That doesn't mean I wouldn't work with a competitor if they were willing to come along and pay me. So it's just like, I think having those conversations prior to like investing that amount of money or even taking equity in any of those deals. Yeah. I, I've started trying to ask for a portion of equity portion of cash, trying to hedge my position on companies I really like. Uh, it's surprising to me how few companies are willing to give any equity. And, and part, I feel weird about it because it's like, on the one hand, it, it's on the one hand, it's like, if they're giving me equity, then I'm like, wait a second, why are they giving me equity? If, if they're that good, why would they give me that? But on the other hand, if they're not giving me equity, I'm like, wow, maybe, maybe it's, they believe in it so much more because they're not willing to give it. So it's like, either way. Yeah. You, you can't, you can't, you, you don't know, but yes, but I, I am trying at this point to build, I'd rather build potential equity than I would cash now, at least for, for me at this point. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the move to Vegas? I, I know you made multiple videos on this. You used to live in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. I think I, I could probably make some guesses of why, why the move happened. Uh, I actually lived in Vegas for two and a half years uh, when mm -hmm. I started my career and it's, it's great. I lived in Summerlin and I, you know, yeah, I ended up leaving so. to now live in Texas, which is also uh, a no state or no state income tax state. But mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about that move, why it was so important for your business? Yeah. So I was up until the pandemic, I was going into the real estate office, uh, the Oppenheim group five days a week. But when the shutdown happened and we were in LA and, um, and Jack came and uh, we started, we started really working full time from the house. That really made me realize, like, wait a second, we we could do this from anywhere. And I realized, too, it's like the house that we were living in in, in Los Angeles, I mean, we could get so much more space and uh, things were so expensive. And, and, and absolutely, I mean, from the financial component of it, you start adding up like, okay, here's how much I'm spending on this. I have zero say where the money is going. I feel like it's just completely misused. And I could go over here get something double the size, save a significant amount of money. Um, it just started making a lot of sense. And once, once, once we started looking at houses in Las Vegas, I 
realized, like, wait a second, it, it's like these are really nice places. And it was Summerlin. Like I was blown away. And for half the cost of living in Los Angeles, you could get a house that's double the size, a brand new construction. And we were close to a lot of the other finance people up there. Everybody seems to be within like a 15 minute radius. So it started to make a lot of sense. And at first, honestly, I was kind of like on the fence about it. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to like it. Immediately loved it. And now, and now it's weird to come back to LA. Like it's strange because we'll, we'll come back every now and then to see family and whatnot, but it's weird. I it, it's, and I've, cause I grew up in Los Angeles. So to me it was, it's always felt like home, but now when you drive down, it's like, geez, these roads are terrible. What is this traffic? It's, it, I don't know if it changed, but I think it's just my perception of, of having so much more space, no traffic. Everyone is nice. It feels like a community. Never really had that. Yeah. And obviously taxes probably helps a little bit too. <laughs> uh, yes. I mean, there's certainly, there's absolutely the financial component of it too, where it's just like, it's a lot more money that I could reinvest elsewhere. And uh, yeah, even just being able to hire now a, another person to help on the, the family vlog channel. I mean, it's just, there, there's so much more possibility and more money that I could reinvest into these startups to then make content about. So yeah, you also no longer need to be in LA if you're in the creator community or if you're in entertainment, it's everywhere. Even if you think of the top 10 YouTube channels in the world, I don't think a single one of them is in California. Like there's like obviously PewDiePie is in a different country and Mr. Beast is in North Carolina and so and so and so and so. So I just don't think it has that like uh, that like effect that it used to have to like live in Los Angeles and be in that like entertainment capital of the world. I don't even think LA is the entertainment capital of the world anymore. It's like lost that luster. I mean, even for me, like living in LA is like buying everything from the airport. It's like all yeah, overly it expensive. It's crazy. So it I, is. it's, you'd be amazed. Like I, if I showed you a list of like all the YouTube creators that have moved to Las Vegas, it's not just finance channels. It's like Twitch streamers, uh, Matt Stoney lives in Las Vegas. It just goes, the list goes like on and on of people that have moved outside of California. That is so true. And that's one of the things as well, where I thought, um, about a year and a half ago, I was like, I could never move from Los Angeles because everyone is here. It's like everyone I collaborate with is here. It showed me how, how wrong I was about that because I'm getting more opportunities being in Las Vegas. And it's so easy that Las Vegas airport everyone loves flying into Las Vegas. It's and, and the hotels are all like 10 minutes away. People love to stay at Red Rock Casino, which is like five minutes away from the house. It's great. Like I've never invited someone to be like, Hey, you want to come to Las Vegas for a weekend? No, but LA is more like, well, where am I going to stay? These hotels are expensive. Las Vegas is like, Hey, come one, come all. We like, they want you to go there. Exactly. You've been, I mean, it's amazing because you've, you've been so transparent of just like how much you've made on YouTube, how much you've made just as a creator in general. I'm curious, like, you know, obviously you've been public about your AdSense and things like that, but how do you think about just like diversifying as a creator yourself? And like, I imagine we're going to see some version of like the ESPN 30 for 30 broke for like creators where they all burn out and like waste their money. You're obviously thinking much longer term, uh, but how do you just think about like not just relying on AdSense? And I know you've watched, watched like some businesses and things like that, but outside of YouTube AdSense, how else are you like monetizing and like, what is your yeah, stack so, of I mean revenue? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, outside of that, there's also obviously sponsorships, affiliates, program sales. Uh, and then basically all of that is just reinvested. I mean, I, I don't know what percentage I spend. It's very little. I, I probably should do a better job diversifying, but uh, at, at the same time, it's like I spend so little that it doesn't, it doesn't matter to the point where it's like, if, if something disappears, I'm going to be like, oh crap, I, I built this lifestyle I can't sustain. I really try to keep it where I only spend whatever my investments make and, and never any more than that. So anything I purchase at this point is just like these, this is, this is sustainable. So, but yeah, but I, I probably like finance, financially, I probably should diversify a little bit more, but, uh, but yeah, I would say, I mean, a bulk of it, probably like 50% definitely is just YouTube ad revenue. But, but then I've also diversified across channels where it's like, even if, knock on wood, like something happens to one channel, I have four others to fall back on. And 
any of those four are fantastic. I mean, just one of those would be able to be enough to, to pay for everything. So uh, really, it's just a lot of icing on the cake at this point. Mm -hmm. and, and one of those uh, other revenue streams, obviously, is a company now called Bankroll Coffee, which I kind of <laughs> wanted to get into. But I also wanted to get, before we get into the company, and I have a bunch yeah. of questions about it, I want to ask about the launch strategy um, and even if this was part of the launch strategy with you actually getting sued before you even no, launched the brand, I was so can you talk a little bit about like what the story was, how it happened, and then uh, I actually have yeah. some, uh, as well. So I'm excited to try it. So, yeah, so the coffee thing was, it, it was a joke. Uh, two years ago, I made a video, how to make iced coffee. Well, basically I had this guy call in my second channel and we, basically that whole concept was people would call in with their money problems and I would do a Dave Ramsey on them except I would just be open to like credit cards and stuff like that. So, so anyway, this guy came in and he was making all this money doing e-commerce and we were trying to go through and like optimize his budget and we're like, where he's spending it. And his thing was that he was spending like seven, $800 a month on, on Pete's coffee because uh, he just, he would go and buy a coffee and like a bagel and stuff like that. It was like seven, $8 a day. It's like, that's stupid when you could buy Pete's coffee at the store and make, make it yourself. And I was like, my coffee, is only 20 cents. Like this is literally 20 cent iced coffee that you're spending $7 for. So people started making jokes about that in the comments. And then to, to play into that, I made a video, how to make 20 cent iced coffee. And for some reason, that was one of my most viewed videos on, a, on that channel. Just, they didn't care. They just wanted to know how to make 20 cent iced coffee. So a year and some change after that, did a big package in the mail. And it was hundreds of K cups of coffee with a handwritten letter on it from this guy and he said he ran this e-commerce business and they specialize in the sale and packaging of like foods and snacks and he wanted to partner partner with me to start a coffee brand so i talked to him and instantly we just hit it off on the phone and i was like and i basically was committed already just over the phone it's like you know when you kind of like have a feeling about something i was like i have a feeling about this this is good we just we aligned on everything and uh so yeah, so we, we spent a few months, maybe like five months, basically coming up with Brew Culture. That was the name, B-R-U Culture. And we, we were hyped on it. I mean, we came up with a, with a, I thought this packaging was awesome. It was like a black, uh, black package with like, go, like almost like reflective fluorescent gold coffee where it's this brew across the top. Like we, we probably spent, uh, seven to ten thousand dollars on like we got every we got like mugs we got cups we got like you know thousands of bags with brew culture and i was so excited about this so they posted a little teaser on instagram and i got a message uh shortly afterwards from someone saying that they own the right to brew beer and i was like oh crap and he's like we own the trademark to everything with brew in the beverage category and so like i, I don't know trademark so we called up a trademark attorney who's really good. And he looked it over. He's like, hey, listen, they don't have a case, but if they want to be difficult, they, they, they can go after you for this. Uh, they, they have a case. They're not going to win it. But do you want to spend your time defending this? And it's going to cost you anywhere from like ten grand to $50,000 fighting this thing. And it's not worth it. So his advice was like, don't literally don't pay me a retainer do something else. And so I was upset. I was really, I mean, it ruined my day uh, because we were a week away from launching. And for this to come up a week before, we had spent like five months on this to start over. And I liked brew culture, sucked. So a few weeks later, we just so happened to come up with the name of bankroll coffee. And I liked it even more. And it gave us so much more flexibility to come up with like hodl coffee or like double down coffee and plain to hold into the whole finance theme. And it was so different than any other coffee. I mean, even there, 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 there's other coffees out there with a similar name of brew, not brew culture, but you know, like who cares? It, it, it's, it's similar enough where it's like, we didn't differentiate ourselves. So thankfully this happened. Like at the time I was upset. I was really upset. I was disappointed. But looking back now, that was such a blessing in disguise that I didn't realize until much later. So that whole thing ended up working to my advantage and I was very thankful for him. So I, I'm glad it worked out the way it did. And that video I posted, believe it or not, uh, was because originally I couldn't think of a video idea. And this is like, this was three weeks before I posted, by the way. 
couldn't think of a video idea. I'm like, what can I talk about? What can I talk about? Let, let me at least make a video talking about the coffee company. And this was meant to be a lead up to the real reveal. This is just meant to be like a, hey guys, here's what happened to the coffee. Here's why it's delayed, but I'll come out with the full video later. That was it. But it worked out well. We've sold 10,000 bags of coffee just from, I don't know if it's just from that video, but we haven't done any other promotion besides that video and a few like Instagram, you know, I'll repost people's stories, but 10,000 bags of coffee. So my next pivot here is just to see how much of this is being sold as a novelty, as just a, ooh, Graham's got coffee, let me go and buy it, versus how much of this is, uh, how many people are gonna be return customers? So that's what I, I don't know if this is just a one-off or are people really gonna keep buying this on a regular basis? I'm worried it's a bit of a novelty because it's like, ooh, fun, bankroll coffee and then they never order again so we'll see that's yet to be determined Ooh, that's, that's awesome i mean it, it could be fun as well to experiment with just like subscriptions and that side of it and just seeing like i, I know in your video you talk about how you sort of want this to not just be like this is you know graham's coffee company you sort of want this to be yeah. like this is just a coffee company that exists and ideally people use it and maybe don't even know or like you know try it and they don't even know that it's tied to you I, I think it could be fun to experiment with like just subscription and, and that side of it as well. Yeah. At some point, like I don't want to be the, like the, the, the front person for this coffee. Like, uh, like I look at, um, like Emma Chamberlain, her coffee and I got it. It's cause I got a lot of these, these coffees, see what it is. Hers is expensive. Gosh. I, I think my order came to like $20 for like five or six things of iced coffee. It was a lot of money, but I'm thinking to myself, like, is this a brand that could stand on its own? Maybe, but I wanted Bankroll to be totally separate from myself. So I'm happy to push it and get it in the right direction. But at some point, I'd love for people to see a Bankroll coffee, like Facebook ad or something like that. Have no idea who I am. W when that starts happening and we can start converting cold traffic or people just talk about it word of mouth or think it's funny or they give it a gift and people are like, oh, where do you get this? That's the point where I would be very happy. Yeah. Do you have any new projects coming up that you're excited about? Yeah. So I got a, uh, an app that I've been working on with uh, a good friend of mine, Jeremy Financial Education. It's a financial related app, you know, like, like a, not a, a bit like a newsletter, but some sort of daily updates that come to you on the app instead of an email. Because once you download an app, you're not deleting the app. Like I know for myself, when I download an app, it's on there. Like, unless they physically run out of space on the phone, I'm keeping the app there like, just in case. Cause it doesn't, you know, whatever. So we started building out the app and then we realized uh, through test groups that like people like the app for other reasons other than the newsletter. So now we're trying to tweak and figure out like, you know, it's a finance based app. So it provides a lot of stock market data and analysis, but what started off as an email newsletter, then developed to an app newsletter now is transitioning to something else. So, we're figuring that out, but I think some sort of finance based product is probably the next, uh, next step. The, the one thing that like, I, I did want to talk a little bit cause I, I watched a lot of your videos on crypto and Dogecoin and Bitcoin and stuff like that. And I, I'd watched your content. It was kind of like, you know, maybe a video every year, like now and then, but once you started making crypto content and I, and this was like when it was blowing up, I was fully into it. Are you still invested in crypto? Cause I know that you get videos where you're like, I got completely burned, like investing in this coin and this coin. Like, what are your thoughts right now on like the, the evolution of crypto, where it's at? And then are you still invested? Yeah. I mean, I haven't, I haven't gotten burned in, in crypto, not since like 2017. So any video that I made on that was probably three, four years ago, but, um, no, I'm, I'm still, I haven't sold in, I mean, there, there's a slight little bit for tax loss harvesting purposes, which worked out to my favor. But besides that, I've just continued adding and, uh, you know, I, I just, I made a goal at the beginning of the year, by the end of the year, I just want 5% of my portfolio between 60, 40 Bitcoin, Ethereum. That's my goal. So I'm not going too crazy with that. 5% I think is reasonable. I did 10,000 in Dogecoin as part of like a fun little, like, I think, I think I said like, if, if a video gets a hundred thousand likes, I'll put 10,000 in Dogecoin. Got a hundred and something thousand likes. I put 10,000 in Dogecoin. I don't care. I mean, it honestly, like if it loses money, I make a video about it a year from now, but, but my goal or, or what I said in the video is I'll buy 10,000 Dogecoin and just keep it for a year. Then I'll report back. So either way for me, it's just, it's, 
at that point, it's essentially the same as like a business expense. But Bitcoin, Ethereum, I've still bought. When Ethereum dipped below like 1800 recently, I bought a little bit more. When Bitcoin is at 31, I bought a little bit more. I'm not going crazy with it. But yeah, but speaking of a lot of this crypto, just too many scam altcoins. I, I think it's just going through the same crap that we saw in 2017, where people just creating crap because it makes money. It's I can't see how this is not regulated. I cannot see how the SEC is not, and they will. I think at some point because they're going to track everything. I get, I say give it a few years. They're going to look at all these influencers promoting these just random altcoins and. I don't listen. I, I doubt there's ever going to be any jail time. I, I think to ever convict somebody for something like it's not worth your time. I think they're going to go through and issue fines. That's what I think. The last thing I just want to wrap on um, is, you know, I think Blake and I, you know, we've talked about this a lot. Like we're we're so bullish on just the financial sector of YouTube going forward for the next decade because we think that not only is the audience growing on YouTube, but it's also getting older. It's like kids. Like I, I found YouTube. Eight years ago, I still watch. What I watch is completely different from what I watched eight years ago. And people are finding your channel. They're finding other financial literacy channels. Are there any channels out there that like stick out to you that are like up and coming that you've worked with? Just curious, like who who you're seeing that you think will you know potentially grow over the next few years? Wait, are we talking about a personal creator? Or we're talking about like a segment? Personal creator, yeah. Personal creator within finance. Personal creator within finance. Uh, it's I can be wish... real estate, yeah. Yeah, I wish Nate O'Brien would post more. Mm. He's doing yeah. van he's doing van life right now. Uh, his videos are so well thought out. He's just too laid back. And I've told him this. I have a feeling someone's going to send this to him. So Nate, hey, and I've been telling I've been telling Nate this for like 2 years. I I it's just not in his personality though. But I'm like, dude, you got to post like twice a week, stay consistent with it. Your videos are so good. And Nate's like, Ugh. I, I just want to go travel. Uh, I'll make a video when I need to. And you know what? But that's what that's what makes his video so good. Nate O'Brien, I think he's doing band life right now. Oh, man. If he just posted twice a week. It, it's, I completely it's, agree. It's hard for me because I, I see like I see his potential and I'm like, it, it could be so good if you just post twice a week. Not doing it. Uh -huh. Totally agree. He has but, three yeah. videos in the last three and a half months right now. So what are you doing, Nate? Figure it out. Come on, Nate. I know. So I, I've been telling him this for a while, but you know what? He, he's he's very happy. He has no stress. He owns nothing. He got rid of his apartment. He's living the dream. He's got no responsibility at all. So listen, part of me envies that. So besides besides Nate O'Brien, I I like meet Kevin a lot. His resiliency in terms of uh, pivoting his content on a moment's notice and keeping his audience engaged is so surprising. He started making stimulus content when he was at like 200,000 subscribers, posted more than any other creator I, I, I've ever seen, posting like five, six videos a day on his own, was able to transition that from stimulus to meme stocks, blow up that audience, then transition from that to then running for governor. It's just like, Mind blowing. Uh, I want to. I want to see him at some point become like the next CNBC. He he will just become his own news network. That's what I'd like to see from him. Um, those are the two that I would say. Uh, Kevin, I watch pretty much all of his videos. But anyone else in the financial space? Um, gosh, I'm sure there's there's some people that, that I'm just forgetting right now. Yeah, there's quite a few. There's quite a few that have like. 500,000 to a million subscribers that I think fast forward two, three years from now are going to be in that five plus million subscriber mark. Name, name a few. Because you know who I'm thinking of? Brian John. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to pop off. Um, I actually like have loved Nate's content. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm the same as you, like just sad he doesn't upload more. I really am. The other one too, like, uh, and Jimmy and I know him pretty well is Alex Becker. Uh, you brought him up oh, earlier. Yeah, I, I like love that. his content. I just love the style of the videos. Um, so we'll we'll see where he's at if he continues to be consistent over the next he's like not. few years. He's not. Yeah, I, I, I've yeah, ta I've talked to him before. I think he's so underrated. I think a lot of people gave him crap because he was running YouTube ads for quite some time. But he is so smart. And when I listened to, and he was one of the original people that for me like really inspired me to get into YouTube. Cause he was showing me that like you could make videos about business and people would watch them. 
and I started watching Alex Becker when he was under 10,000 subscribers. And I, I would hang on to every word he said, everything. And even now, I, he made a video a long time ago about why he stopped making YouTube videos and how he used me as an example, by the way, in that video. And I was just like, I was glued to my, my phone just listening to this. But he said, the problem with me is that for me to continue, it's, it's me. It's like, I am the face of this. People are only coming for me. And that bottlenecks me at some point, because if, if I want to do something else and I'm not there, people are going to tune out because they're just going for me with him. On the other hand, he says by creating a software that could grow independently of himself. And that stuck with me. It's very true. So he decided to go a different angle. I continued on my path to, to be just myself, but he's right. He, he has a really good point on that. So at least now I know what I'm getting myself into and like where, what direction I'm going. At least I, I acknowledge that he's extremely smart. So I, I take his advice very seriously. And then the last channel, Blake and I actually talked about this channel like seven months ago, but it's black hustlers club. Um, and I think he's grown. Let me look at his channel. I think he's at 150,000 subscribers now. Blake, do you remember what he was at when we initially talked about it? Was it like 40 K yeah, or something, something like that? that? It was, it was definitely yeah, lower. So, yeah. So there, there is a few financial that. channels that are starting to do well. So, oh, you know what? Bia has a, has another one. Yeah. This is, this is interesting. His thumbnails remind me of Andre Jick. Very similar with all the money in the front. Yeah, if, if Andre, Jake, and Bia has a combined their thumbnails, it would be, oh, look, you see, see here's, here's what I find interesting is uh, like uh, how I earned $100,000 at age 19. A lot of these thumbnails I, I see were, were inspired by my thumbnails. It's, it's always interesting to see when I've done a thumbnail and then usually within a few weeks of that, you see just other iterations of that sort of thumbnail. It's, it's interesting how that works. It's because then you have to one up that. And you have to think of something different. Like how can you be different from that now? Because everyone is now doing that same style. And like, so it's, it's interesting how it's this evolving thing that like you do something that works for a little bit, everyone catches on to it. It doesn't work anymore. You gotta do something else. Yep. Well, we appreciate you coming on, man. I know we're a little over an hour here. I hope everyone finds this super interesting. I know we covered every topic that I had on my sheet. So Blake, anything else you want to go? No, over? thank you for coming on, Grant. This is sure. awesome. Thank you. No, I had a lot of fun. Thanks, man.